Hey everybody, welcome to part two of chapter three. So we're going to get right into um, the cell theory, which is section 3.2 of your textbook. If you're looking at the textbook, it's page 94. If you're online, then it's section 3.2. So that's what I can tell you. Um, there are two basic tenets to the cell theory. That is that all cells come from existing cells and that cells are the fundamental units of life. So the cell theory was being produced at the same time as people were still arguing for spontaneous generation. There were multiple individuals that were important in um, supporting and in producing the cell theory, including Robert Hooke, Matthias Schleiden, Theodore Schwann, Robert Remack, and Rudolf Virchow. Yeah. Um, the cell theory basically states that living things are composed of cells and cells produce new cells, but there are different types of cells. We know that there are prokaryotic cells, cells that are pre-nucleus, and then eukaryotic cells, cells that contain a nucleus. But when was the nucleus actually first identified? This was in 1831. A Russian, or I'm sorry, not Russian, a Scottish botanist uh, named Robert Brown identified the nucleus. And then following on that, a German botanist, Andrea Schimper, um, was the first to describe chloroplasts of plant cells. And she basically noted that chloroplasts were the area where starch was formed and that they divided independently of the nucleus. So the idea that they divided independently of the nucleus um, was of a lot of interest to a Russian botanist. I'm not going to try to pronounce his name right now. Um, no, I will. Marichowski. I don't know if that's perfect, but that's as good as I can get. Um, in 1905, he suggested that chloroplasts may have um, originated from photosynthetic bacteria. So this is in 1905. So he was the first to suggest this idea that eukaryotic cells came from original prokaryotic ancestors. This was known as the endosymbiotic hypothesis. And then Ivan Wallen, an American anatomist, um, decided to take information, take this um, hypothesis and look at animal cells. And he noted that mitochondrial um, organelles also could replicate independently of the nucleus. And he um, hypothesized that they also were um, they originated as or from prokaryotic microbes that were able to produce energy or lots of energy. So this is, again, in the early 1900s, they're starting to look at these different ideas about how the cells came about. It wasn't um, that this endosymbiotic hypothesis wasn't really taken in. Most scientists just ignored it. Um, not that they discounted it and said it wasn't real, but they there was just it was hard to study um, the cells and to identify if these structures really were from bacteria or if they came from something else. So they they kind of um, went off and this hypothesis just fell under, like it just, just went away or just was ignored, okay? Then Lynn Margulis in the 60s, she revitalized the hypothesis and she started working on um, and doing research and she published her own ideas of the endosymbiotic hypothesis in 1967. And in the 1980s, she ended up, um, the endosymbiotic hypothesis became the endosymbiotic theory, 
which is how eukaryotic cells came to be. And this was done using DNA sequencing because this is when we started um, being able to see and study DNA really effectively. And um, so Lynn Margulis is the individual who gets the credit for um, the endosymbiotic theory, but there was a lot of scientists that worked on this theory. So what is this endosymbiotic theory then? Um, basically, it's a theory that states that uh, mitochondria and, and chloroplasts in organisms originated or have their origins in bacteria. So bacterial cells produced the first eukaryotic cells. So bacteria were here before eukaryotes. We know this anyways. Um, we just didn't know how it happened. And so um, what we believe happened is you had a large bacterial cell and this bacterial cell has um, the DNA in its nucleoid region, so a region of the cell. And as the DNA is sitting there, there are some infoldings of the membrane, the plasma membrane, and these infoldings start to form around the nucleus or the, the DNA, kind of like to protect the DNA. And that forms that first nucleus. So where did these organelles come from, right? Well, you have this large cell that now has this specialized structure that can tell the cell what to do. Well, cells need to eat, so the cell engulfs a smaller cell, a bacterial cell, and that bacterial cell maybe is an aerobic bacterium. Aerobic bacterium are able to use oxygen and carbohydrates and produce a lot of energy in the form of ATP. So instead, when it engulfs, instead of eating the bacterium for food, the bacterium stays inside the cell and starts utilizing um, its own function, energy production. It takes nutrients from that larger cell and produces ATP. So this cell now is getting its nutrients without having to do any work, and this cell is getting all of its energy without having to do any work. So they're both benefiting, okay? So this is a symbiotic relationship. It's an endosymbiosis because one cell is engulfed inside another cell, and it's a mutualistic relationship because they're both benefiting. This cell could also take in a photosynthetic bacterium. So what do photosynthetic bacterium do? They take sunlight energy and carbon dioxide and they convert that carbon dioxide into a carbohydrate. So this cell, without the photosynthetic cell inside, has to take in carbohydrates of some sort to produce energy. This cell produces its own carbohydrates. So it does not have to take in any type of uh, carbohydrate for energy because it's producing all of them. So when this cell comes in again, instead of degrading it for food, this cell lives and takes materials from the parent cell, the large cell, and utilizes its own um, metabolic machinery and produces carbohydrates. So now we have mitochondria. We have chloroplasts inside in this endosymbiotic um, relationship, and they're all benefiting from each other. And so this ends up producing a photosynthetic eukaryotic organism, like a plant or algae. Over here, when we just had the aerobic bacterium, we produced a uh, modern heterotrophic eukaryote, like an animal cell or fungal cell. So there are different evidences that support this theory. The first is that both chloroplasts and mitochondria have two membranes. They have 
the um, an inner membrane, which is very similar to that of the bacterial ancestor. And then they have an outer membrane, which is more like the eukaryotic cell that it's found in. They have their own DNA, and the DNA is circular, single-stranded, just like bacterial DNA. They have their own proteins inside that allow them to, um, or they have their own proteins, and they have their own ribosomes. The ribosomes are those of bacterial origin, so they're called 70S ribosomes, which are smaller than the eukaryotic 80S ribosomes. They replicate separately from the cell so that they can replicate on their own. And if you take chloroplasts or mitochondria from the cell, the cell itself cannot produce new chloroplasts or mitochondria. All of these support this endosymbiotic theory. And maybe. Okay. I actually am going to stop here. So we talked about the cell theory, and now we're going to talk about um, importance of cells, um, specific microbial cells or bacterial cells, and um, how they can cause, or not how they can, and the detriments of some of those same microbes. So, But I'll do that in the next video because this is already 11 minutes, so we'll get another video going shortly. Bye.